will tell you that Matthew chapter 24 deals a lot with prophecy. But I will say this. It doesn't deal so much with prophecy concerning the church as it does Israel. Uh, when people begin studying the Bible, they assume because Matthew's in the New Testament, it's written to the church. You've got to be very careful taking doctrine out of the book of Matthew to the church. The book of Matthew was not written to the church, it was written to the Jews. A lot of people love the Sermon in the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and they'll preach that. But that sermon was given by Jesus to the Jews for the Jews. And can I say, the same with Matthew 24, there are a lot of people get doctrine all messed up on the end times because they base it out of Matthew 24 and try to apply it to the church. And again, it's written to the Jews. The book of Matthew shows Jesus as the Messiah. He came as the King of glory to the Jews, and it's portrayed that way in Matthew. Uh, many Jews today are still looking for Messiah to come. Well, he came 2,000 years ago. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And he came as the king, and he's uh, demonstrated in the book of Matthew as the king to the Jews. And uh, it's very important. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, you find that uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. And he's dealing with the Jews, and he's dealing with them in the kingdom. And we're not in the kingdom. And we're going to bring some of that out tonight. And the kingdom is yet to come. And uh, just to let you in on some insight, Brother Brian, uh, when he says the meek shall inherit the earth, he's talking about the new earth. And I'm not looking for the new earth. I'm looking for the new heaven. In the city called New Jerusalem. That's where the church is going. Hmm? We get to reign with him. We get to dwell with him. And those that rejected him and come to trust in him through the tribulation period, they get the new earth. And they've got to come to where we are to see him. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out. Uh, but in Matthew 24, it says, If you endure till the end, you shall be saved. I'm not enduring anything. I'm enjoying the trip. Again, it's dealing with the Jews, and it's dealing with the tribulation period. They have to endure that period and do not partake of the mark of the beast in order to get to go to heaven. You and I, we'll already be there. But let me show you something here in Matthew 24 as we continue our study. In Baptist distinctives. We'll begin reading in verse 32. Now keep in mind, the Jews required a sign, and the Greeks or the Gentiles required or seek after wisdom. Okay? In, Jew, in chapter 32 of Matthew 24, the Bible says, Now learn a parable. And a parable is a earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour no man knoweth, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 
Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and would have not suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the good singing. Our hearts were uplifting. Lord, uh, the congregational singing helped us. The special singing helped us. We thank you for that. Father, we thank you for these, our dear brothers and sisters that, Lord, have been sick, but, Lord, they've come through the sickness and are now back with us. Thank you, Lord, for touching them, being with them, and helping them. And Lord, I'm sure they're not up to 100% in body. It takes a little while to get it all back. So, Lord, I pray you'd continue to sustain them and help them. Father, I pray for those that are still sick or still in quarantine. God, you'd help them and touch them and bring them back to us at the next appointed hour. Now, Father, I pray you'd help us now. Lord, illuminate our minds and God, speak to our hearts and show us uh, eternal truths that will impact us today and for all of eternity. Help it, help it uh, Lord, draw us closer to you that we might live like you'd have us to live now, but help us to take these truths and impact people that don't know the truth. Lord, there's so many out there that twist the scriptures or so many that just reject the scriptures. And God, there's a sad day coming for them unless we reach them with the gospel. So Father, give us the insight, the words, and the wisdom to let people know Jesus loves them, Jesus will save them, but Lord, let them know also that Jesus is coming soon. Now, Father, I pray that, Lord, you'd have your will and way amongst us tonight. Lord, encourage your people, increase our faith, get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it, for it's in Jesus' wonderful name, as we already sang about. We ask it all. Amen and amen. I want you to notice a couple of things from the text that we read. I want you to notice the apologues or the pictures or the types, the signs that Jesus gave the Jews in this chapter. We find in verse 32, he talks about the fig tree budding. And he talks about things that they understood. You know when a fig tree begins to bud and bloom leaves, you know that summer is nigh. And he's letting them know this, but what he is referring to, they wanted to know the sign of his coming. And so he lets them know you can put a barometer on it when the fig tree starts to bud. My dear friends, the fig tree here is a picture or type of the nation of Israel. Most of you know that when Jesus walked among men, Israel was under bondage to the Romans. Uh, about 70 years after he uh, ascended back into heaven, Jerusalem was totally destroyed, uh, and Israel was dispersed throughout the world. Uh, Israel was not a nation or a people of themselves. Uh, she served under other nations uh, until 1948. Uh, in 1948, she became a nation, uh, and the fig tree began to show some buds, uh, and the fig tree has sprouted some leaves, uh, and now she's been a nation for a long time uh, and the Bible said that that generation wouldn't pass away until his coming. And can I say something? Many Bible scholars thought that a generation was 40 years. There was uh, books written about uh, his coming in the great 1988 uh, and all kinds of things. They thought that he was certainly coming. Uh, there was a book come out at night called 1984 and they described he was coming. And there's been many date setters about when the Lord would return. Uh, my dear friends, uh, we don't have to go very far, but look with me in verse 36. I want you to see this. But of that day and hour... No man knoweth, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. 
In Jesus' own statement, is he is saying that he didn't know the day or the hour. Yep, Only the Father knows. Yep. So if Jesus don't know, some pinhead around here writing a book don't know. All right? All I know is that God increased a generation to 70 years, and then he said if you live beyond that, you lived in the blessings of God. All I know is, friend, uh, we are getting close. Hmm? Now, there's a lot of factors and why you can't set a date. The Jews keep a different calendar than, than the Roman Greco calendar that we keep. That's why Easter's at a different time every year. Do you ever wonder why sometimes it's in March, sometimes it's in April? Because it's based on Jewish Passover. Yep. Hmm? They keep a different calendar. Theirs has days and months and sometimes whole years at our time. So we don't know. Hmm, but friend, I can tell you, the fig tree's been blooming for a while. And it could be any time. He also mentions, as in the days of Noah, he was, uh, set, describes they were eating and drinking and giving in marriage, and what he is describing is a raucous lifestyle. Matter of fact, the days were so evil in the days of Noah that God even repented that he made man. And he said, it'll be like that, where everybody's mind was on themselves, uh, upon living wickedly uh, and they had no conscience toward God Noah preached righteousness for 120 years and didn't have one convert hmm? Hmm, can I say when you look around our country a country that was founded on the principles and oracles of the word of God much of our law came from the Bible and from Judeo uh, and Christian principles do you realize that uh, uh, America used to be the gold standard for a righteous Christian nation? And yet America has aborted 62 million babies since 1974. Amen. You think America's going to get away with that? Do you know America is not even a, a picture of what she used to be? Used to America reverence the things around the church. We've had governors try to shut down the church this year over a virus. Used to when viruses, uh, when illnesses came, uh, when cities were stricken, stricken uh, and folks were dying in droves, uh, they came to the church and pleaded for somebody to get a hold of God. Mm, thanks be unto God. President Trump put in some conservative Supreme Court justices, and on Monday they ruled that you can't put a limit on how many people can attend a church service. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Like we were limiting anything anyway. Na 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 boo boo to Governor Brazier. Yes. Sure. Hmm. Huh? But he is a deacon of his church. <laughs> and if you. Uh, if you buy into what all they stand for, his church might be crispy critters before it's all said and done. Anyway. Because uh, he's for aborting babies. He's for the gambling crowd. He's for the drunken crowd. He's for uh, uh, the wicked crowd. Uh, he's for the gay crowd, the transgender crowd. Uh, he's for the Black Lives Movement. Uh, but he's against law and order, and he's certainly against the church. Doesn't sound like somebody's going to heaven in that crowd, huh? Mm -hmm. just thought I'd throw that in but he gives two pictures here one concerning the nation of Israel and one concerning the society of the world and he said when you see those things come to pass you know you're getting close so we see the apologues and we also find in these verses that we're to be aware of his coming Look what it says in verse 36. But of that day and hour no man knoweth, no not the angels of heaven, but of my Father only. You need to be aware that he is coming, you just don't know when. Look at verse 44. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Friend, he's coming. And he's coming soon. 
It amazes me how many people want God to bless them and their endeavors and their house and, and you know, somebody in their family sick and got COVID and they've got all these things that they want God to do for them. But they don't darken the doors of church or they put God on the back burner and they, they only want God to do something for them, for them in, uh, in a temporary thing. But they're not concerned about doing anything for God. Yeah, amen, Pastor. Hmm? We should be anxious and excited and thrilled to get to come to God's house and sing songs of praise unto God. Sure. I mean, if nothing else 2020 has showed us, that coming to church is a privilege. And if this thing does go south and they do steal this election and they do put uh, monkey brains in, I'm here to tell you, the church has never seen the onslaught that uh, uh, she's going to see in America like what's, what's coming. My Aunt Lynn used to sing that song about going back and, and, and it said there will come a time when, when you're going to see who's in or out. I'm going to tell you, if you won't serve God when you got freedom to, you're not going to serve Him when the heat's on. Hmm? But we're to be aware of His coming. But then we're also to be alert. To, it's one thing to know He is coming. It's another thing to be looking for Him to come. Look what the Bible says in verse 42. Watch, therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Need to be alert. Look at chapter 25. Look at verse 13. It says the same thing. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour where, wherein the Son of Man cometh. You know, it's a sad commentary when we teach our children to look for Santa Claus, but we don't teach them to look for Jesus. You know why? Because mom and daddy ain't looking for Jesus. We know he's coming. We just don't think he's coming tonight. We need to be aware that he's coming. But we need to be alert, looking for him to come. You know why that's important? First John tells us about our blessed hope of the Lord's returning. He says, he that hath this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. And what's that mean? That means if you're looking for Jesus to come, guess what you're not going to be doing? You're not going to be living like you're not looking for him to come. If you're looking for him to come, you're going to be living right, you're going to be doing right, you're going to be walking right, talking right, because you're looking for him to come. Hmm? Huh? You know, used to, uh, uh, when the ladies had the ladies' retreats, remember them ladies when you go away for a night and you'd be gone for two days, you know, and it was just me and the kids? We would absolutely destroy the house. Kids didn't have pick up nothing. They didn't have to put their dishes in, in, in the dishwasher or the sink. Didn't have to do nothing. We got out every toy. We destroyed the place. Till about two hours before Mama got home. And then it was all hands on deck. Let's get this thing cleaned up because Mama will kill us all. You see, when, when we don't think Jesus is coming, we, we don't keep things in order. We don't keep things clean. Huh? But if we think he's on his way, huh? Business going to pick up in our lives. Are you listening? Sure. So with God's help, we'll start tonight. In the next phase in our Baptist distinctives, we will be teaching at least tonight and next week. I don't know how far this is going to take us, but we're going to be teaching on eschatology or the end times. The study of the end times. You see, there's a lot of folks that believe something's about to happen or they believe some things about the end times. They just don't believe it all properly. And again, we are going to believe what the Scriptures teach. And so, let me give you some, some thoughts on the end times and, and uh, where we're going to go with this thing tonight. I don't know how far we get, but we're going to get a little ways, all right? I want to read you a couple verses out of Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, it says this in verse 2. 
If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in, uh, in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. In those three verses, Paul makes two distinct uh, time references. He starts out in verse 2 talking about the dispensation of the grace of God. He goes on to say in verse number 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Now the Apostle Paul was not puffing himself up, but keep in mind, God was speaking to these holy men so they could pin down the word of God so we would know the will of God and the word of God for our lives. And Paul was saying there was things that was not revealed before, but God has revealed them unto me concerning the end times. And uh, he begins to expound on some then, uh, and we're going to look at some things tonight. Now let me say, uh, in these verses we find the terms dispensations and ages. Okay, Time, according to mankind, is divided into three ages. Can I say the first age is called the Antediluvian Age. It lasted from the creation of Eden to the flood. The second age, when it deals with time and mankind, is what we call the present age. And that deals from the flood uh, through the Great Tribulation Period. And then the final age concerning mankind is called the ages of ages. And that will be from the millennial reign of Christ or the millennial reign uh, or millennial age until uh, uh, New Jerusalem is revealed. So we have the antediluvian age, the present age, and the age of ages. There are three ages scoping from the creation of man until New Jerusalem is revealed. Okay? And that total uh, is somewhere around uh, 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 7,100 years or so. Okay? That's the total scope of the history of mankind. Do not believe that man has been around billions of years. Hmm? The same carbon dating that they use uh, to say that man's been here a billion years, somebody found a, a pig uh, uh, bone and they, they tested it. They didn't think it was a pig bone. They said it was some uh, Neanderthal man and they, they claimed that it was tens of thousands of years old until the farmer who buried the pig said, no, that was old Betsy and she gave up the ghost. Huh? That happened down in South America. Don't trust it. Hmm? Uh, the same radar that says uh, Christian can pull you over when you're doing 85, they tested some radio, radar and tell you a tree's doing 110, you know. It's only as good as the science behind it. But when it comes to matters of truth, don't base it on science, base it on God's Word. Amen. God created man, uh, and that was about 6,000 years ago. Okay? Uh, so we find that mankind lives throughout his history in three different ages. But time, according to how God deals with mankind, is divided into eight dispensations. Now, time for mankind is over three ages. But how God deals with mankind is recorded over eight dispensation. Dispensation is a period of time where God deals with man in this way. And there's eight different times in the history of those three ages of how God will deal with man. Let me give them to you. The first dispensation is the Edenic, Edenic dispensation. That was from the creation to the fall. Now we don't know how long Adam and Eve lived in the garden. I believe it was more than three days. Hmm? God created everything, made man in his own enemies, breathed in the man the breath of life, you know, created him out of, out of dirt, he became a glorified mud pie. Adam named everything that was named. I like to bring this out. I heard this uh, 
uh, this week mentioned, I thought, that guy's stealing my thunder. I did the research, research one time. They say over a course of a lifetime, the average man or the average person uses 10% of their brain capacity. Not 10% in any given day, 10% for their whole lifetime. They estimate men like Albert Einstein and some of these men that create some of these algorithms to run those games and to run those uh, 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 things you do on your phones and some of these very super smart people can't even talk to people because they're so smart. They say those people, they use maybe about 17%, 15 to 17% of their brain capacity in their lifetime. Before the fall, Adam was created in the image of God. Adam had 100% of his brain capacity. He could totally recall everything. Adam named everything that was named. Somebody with 10% of the brain capacity or somebody like me that's less than that, you're not going to look at a giraffe and call it a giraffe. Why do you call it a giraffe? I don't know. He just knew that's what it was going to be named. He named every plant, every tree, every animal, every species, every aspect of that's a cloud. He named everything. That didn't happen in a day. He looked at all of the creation. He watched the animals in creation, and he was lonely. You see, there has never been a Dr. Doolittle to where he could go and talk to the animals. And God put him in a deep sleep, took one of his ribs, and made woman because she came from a man. And they had fellowship in the garden. They loved one another in the garden. God told them they could eat of every tree in the, uh, in the garden but one. And contrary to popular belief, they wasn't an apple tree. Hmm? He said, eat of the fruit thereof. What kind of tree was it? I don't know, but it had fruit. That's why I don't like fruit. Can I say, I don't believe it was any different than any other tree. It's just the one God said you can't have. And just like our nature, all you got to do is tell somebody they can't have it or can't do it, and they're drawn to it. Right. I once heard this fellow whose whole family sang, and they all played something. Every one of them, from the littlest to the oldest, played And somebody said, how did you teach them all how to play all them instruments? He said, I told them they couldn't touch them. Hmm. The serpent came, twisted the word of God a little bit, deceived Eve, told her she ate of the fruit, she wouldn't die, that she would become like God and would no good and evil, and she thought, boy, I sure would like to be God like God. Man has never been more like God than she already was. But she was deceived by that sorry, no good serpent. Why do you think he went to Eve and not Adam? Adam got the command directly from God. Eve got it from Adam. Can I say every time it goes through somebody else and filters through somebody else, it loses a little of its significance? I want to tell you something. You hearing me preach and you hearing Jesus directly, you're going to give a whole lot more attention to what he says than you will me. And we may even use the exact same verbiage. It don't matter, the authority behind it. And can I say, she was deceived, she took of the fruit, and then Adam didn't put up a fight. He took the same fruit and ate it. Now let me give you a couple things according to Brother Doug. Number one, God told Adam to keep the garden and dress it. If Adam would have been doing his job, the serpent wouldn't have been around there deceiving Eve in the first place. Let me help you with something, husbands and fathers. God has given you the position to be the head of your home. It's up to you to keep things out of your home that's going to destroy your family. Right. may not be popular, but it'll be right. Amen. 
Can I say this? When Eve took of the fruit and she fell, Adam remembered what it was like before Eve. He knew what it was like with Eve, and he didn't think he could live without Eve. Adam would rather have Eve than God. Because God would come down and walk with him in the cool of the day. He'd rather have Eve's fellowship than God's fellowship. He didn't think he could live without her. That's why he took of the fruit and he ate. And mankind fell and mankind has become degenerate and mankind needs to be regenerated. And the only thing that will do that is the blood of Jesus Christ. The Edenic dispensation only lasted while they were in the garden before the fall. The second dispensation is the antediluvian dispensation. It lasted from Noah, I mean from Adam to Noah. That was about uh, 1,650 some odd years. The antediluvian dispensation. The next dispensation was the post-diluvian dispensation. That happened from Noah to Abraham. The next dispensation is the patriarchal uh, dispensation. The patriarchal, um, how do you say that, Jordan? Patriarchal dispensation. The patriarch, pa no, not patriotic. How do you say it? Patriarchal. Yeah. It's hard to say when you got lips as fat as mine. It was from where all the patri patriarchs came. From Abraham to Moses, Father Abraham, all the way to Father Moses. When the Jews uh, began to d doubt Jesus and question Jesus when he walked among men, they always referred back to Abraham or Moses. They were their patriarchs. Abraham was the father of the faith. Moses was the father of the law. They put more faith in them than they did the Son of God. And can I say, the next was the legal dispensation. That's when God gave Moses the law. And that dispensation, the law lasted from Moses to Christ. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill it. He could not have been our Savior, our Redeemer, had he not been able to keep the law. God gave the law to show us that we couldn't be holy. But he had to send somebody who could be holy and who could keep it. And Jesus Christ did. Uh, he fulfilled the law of God. And uh, the legal dispensation lasted about 1,490 some odd years. And then we find the ecclesiastical dispensation. Uh, it's also known as the fullness of the Gentiles. It's also referred to as the church age. I refer to, and most uh, Baptist preachers refer to, the dispensation of grace. And my dear friends, it started uh, 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 when Jesus got up out of the grave, and it will continue till he takes his church out of here. It's the ecclesiastical dispensation. Can I say the next dispensation is called the messianic dispensation? And that will be the time of the millennial reign of Christ. And then the eighth and final dispensation in which God deals with mankind will be the dispensation of the fullness of time. And that's when there will be a new heaven and a new earth and paradise will be restored. That is your eight dispensations. Also your three ages of when mankind's whole time and timetable with God is equated. Now, I said all that to say this. Paul said that the mystery of Christ had been revealed to him about the dispensation of grace, which we're in right now. What is the mystery of Christ? When will this dispensation end? And so the first thing I want to look at is the next great prophetic event in history. Listen. There is nothing that needs to be fulfilled before the next great event takes place. The next great event in prophecy and scripture that will take place concerning you and I is the rapture of the church. Amen. It's also uh, referred to as the catching away of the saints. You don't find rapture in the Bible, but you do find where the saints will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. 
the catching away of the saints or the translation of the saints. When we're translated from this form to our heavenly form, when we're given a body likened unto the Son of God. Let me give you some scripture concerning the rapture. Uh, the Bible says this in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13. Paul again, who was the one that God revealed the mystery to, wrote this. Uh, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, them which had died in Christ. Uh, uh, he says that you sorrow not. That's very important because a certain sect of the Jews, the scribes, uh, did not believe in resurrection of the dead. They believed when people died, they died like a dog. There was no soul involved. Uh, there was no life after death. They thought that was the end. Uh, and uh, when people would hear that uh, teaching, they would be saddened thinking that uh, their loved ones they would never see anymore. And uh, he's saying, I, I, I wouldn't have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Uh, uh, you and I both know, and I'll read it to you in a minute, uh, Christians don't die, we just go to sleep. Hallelujah. Huh? Uh, uh, he said this, uh, 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 that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Uh, listen, friend, if you bury a loved one that you know was lost, had no testimony of salvation, uh, you know you'll never see them again. Uh, uh, but if, uh, hey, you put somebody in the ground uh, that you know they were saved, uh, uh, you have a blessed hope uh, that not only are you going to spend eternity with Jesus but you'll be reunited with your loved ones uh, he goes on to say this uh, for if we believe that Jesus died uh, and rose again uh, even so them also which sleep in Jesus uh, will God bring with him uh, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord uh, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep uh, for the Lord himself uh, shall descend from heaven He's not sending an angel. He's not sending Peter by the gate. Uh, the Lord himself uh, shall descend from heaven with a shout, uh, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Uh, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Uh, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, there's that term, uh, caught up together with them in the clouds uh, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord uh, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Uh, now he said, now when the Lord comes, he'll bring them which are asleep with him. What's he talking about? Well, friends, when you bury your loved one, we know the Bible teaches to be absent from the bodies and to be present with the Lord. The moment your loved one takes their last breath, the moment they become brain dead, the moment their heart stops beating, their soul leaves this tabernacle of flesh and goes on to glory. Hmm. Hmm. But you see, the Lord promised that we'll get a body fashioned like His, a glorified body. Now the Bible says that God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Okay? Now hang with me here. Just hang with me. I'm just, I'm just going to help you here. Now, he's promised a body like his. Now, if you've ever heard me preach about paradise, about Abraham's bosom, we preach about all those Old Testament saints, they couldn't go to heaven when they died because they had to be saved by the same blood that you and I had to be saved by. So God put them in a place called paradise or Abraham's bosom. It was a perfect environment. It just wasn't heaven. And my dear friends, when Jesus uh, died on the cross, uh, that early resurrection morning before he come up out of the grave, uh, he went and he preached unto them souls there in paradise. Uh, they all believed in the Lord. Uh, uh, the same blood that saved you and I saved them. Uh, the Bible said he led captivity captive. He took them from paradise and took them to glory. Uh, that's why he told Mary Magdalene, he said, Touch me not, for I have not yet fully ascended to my Father. Uh, he still had to take the blood. He still had to take them souls. Uh, and take them to heaven, and they got to go to heaven. What a blessing. Well, listen, just like they had to wait on the blood to save them, those of our loved ones that went on have to wait on a body. And here's what's happened. The Father's a spirit. Their soul, their spirit went on to glory. They're there. Say, what kind of body form do they have now? I have no idea. I haven't been there yet. But I do know this, wherever you buried them, 
whether they was buried at sea, whether their ashes were spread all over the world, whether they were planted in the ground, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, there's coming a day uh, when the trump of God's going to sound, when the voice of an archangel shall ring out, uh, when the Lord Himself shall uh, uh, descend from heaven and step out on the clouds uh, with a shout. Uh, 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 he's going to bring them with Him uh, and their soul's going to come back uh, and that body, wherever it uh, uh, was laid to rest at, uh, is it's going to come up out of the grave uh, and instantly in a moment in a twinkling of an eye that body and that soul is going to be reunited uh, and changed into a glorified body uh, then you and I which are alive and remain uh, we shall be caught up together with them uh, we'll go from this state from this body uh, from this old house of clay uh, and we'll be translated uh, and changed uh, and we'll be with the Lord forevermore hallelujah I don't know about you, but I kind of like it. I almost feel like singing someday again. Uh, it's a blessing to know we're going to be out of here and we'll be with the Lord. Now listen, somewhere, some place, somebody's going to be having church when that happens. The only thing that is going is this body. Our blood will be left here. Your false teeth will be left here. All your cavities, you know, the gold and silver you got in your cavities, that, that's all going to be left here. Your eyeglasses are going to be left here, huh? Your peg legs are going to be left here. Are you listening? Can you imagine coming into that church house after the rapture? It's going to be a bloody, nasty mess. I mean, your clothes are going to be left here and everything. They're going to think some zombies come and attack the place, huh? I don't really care what they think because I like what Kenny Henson used to sing. When Jesus calls me, call me gone. Out of here. Now, Aunt Lynn, when you get to feeling better, you know what I'd like to hear? I'd like to hear you bring back that old song, The Holy Hills. Uh, and these bars of clay shall no longer hold us we out of here she used to sing that song when I was growing up she sang that song that give, song give me chills just think about right now they're going up and down my back we're out of here it's the rapture of the church now Paul wrote this to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verse 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Did he not say to the church at Ephesus, God had revealed the mystery to him? Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means we're not all going to die. He says, But we shall all be changed. Hallelujah. Huh? We're all going to get a body just like Christ. Huh? He said this in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all, or we shall be changed. Uh, now somebody once figured out what a twinkling of an eye is, and it's like one thirty-second, thirty-six uh, exponents to, to a split second. I mean, it's faster than the speed of light. It's faster than anything you can imagine. In other words, before people can blink, we'll go from here to there. Hmm? Go, he goes on to say this he said we shall, we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality then shall be brought to the, pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory O death where is thy sting O grave where is thy victory do you realize there is no sting of death for a Christian Christians and heathens die differently. There is no sting of death. Uh, there was bouncing rocks off of uh, Stephen's head, and he didn't feel one of them. He just asked God to forgive them. And he said, I see Jesus. And then he was with Jesus. Didn't feel a brick. Hmm. And no matter what, takes you out of this world you don't feel it because it's been removed see when the blood of Jesus was applied to you to save you it not only saved your soul from hell it saved you from the sting of death hmm? 
Now, let me give you this in Revelation chapter number 4. This is John's account. He's caught up into the third heaven, and he's blessed to see things that have yet to happen. And he says this in chapter number 4 of Revelation. Verse number 1, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was open. Now what's he saying after this for? In chapters 2 and 3, you have the messages to the churches. And the last message was, Jesus said, I stand outside the door and knock. If any man will open up, I'll come in and sup with him, him with me. We have fellowship, you know. But after the last message to the last church, there's coming a day there's going to be a last message. Could be tonight. John says this, and after this, <laughs> that last message, he said, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. Didn't we hear that the trump of God would sound? It says, as a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither. Now, can I help you with something? The Lord's voice has been described as a voice of many thunderings. His voice has been described as of many waters. If you've ever been to Niagara Falls, and I was a young kid when I was there, but the, the waters going over those falls roar, and you can't even hear yourself think. When you're in the presence of God, His voice is so powerful, it thunders. It's like the roar of waters. But we, said, we also seen that the Lord would descend with a shout, but it said, the voice of an archangel and the trump of God shall sound. Well, here John says he hears this trumpet, and it's just like the trumpet speaking to him. Listen to what he says. He says, as I heard, And I heard, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. You say, what's going to happen? The trumpet's going to sound? And the Lord's going to shout. Say, what's he going to shout? I, I believe he's going to shout something like, come up hither. And it may be so personal, Miss Noreen. You might hear, come up hither, Noreen. You might hear, come up hither, Tommy. All I know is he called Lazarus for us. He said, Lazarus, come forward. He didn't say, come forth everybody to come out of that grave. Are you listening? He called him specifically. Uh, and the Lord uh, uh, knows our name. Are you listening? Uh, and he's given us a new name. He may call us by our new name. Uh, uh, but all I know is we're going to hear his voice. Uh, and we're going from here to there. Uh, and John said immediately he was in the spirit. Uh, and he was before the throne. Uh, and there was one sitting on the throne. Uh, and say what's going to happen immediately. Uh, we're going to be before the throne of God. And we're going to be screaming our lungs out. Worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Huh? Sure will. Uh, That's good. No wonder Paul wrote this to Titus in Titus 2.13. He says, looking for that blessed hope, what, that the Lord's coming. Yeah. Uh, the glorious appearing of the great God uh, and our Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, again, it's about being alert, looking for His coming. Uh, Paul said it's a blessed hope. Can I help you? what hope we have what if all your hope was who gets to sit in a white house on January 20th mm, regardless of which one you're for what if that's the only hope you had what if the only hope you have is that the virus works or I mean the vaccine works uh, listen the one CEO of the vaccine company they, they ask him if he took the vaccine he says oh no I, I don't want to be stingy I want to share it with others first yeah, if he ain't taking it, I ain't taking it. Uh, Miss Nett was watching something this morning. She was getting ready, and, and some doctor promised he'd take it on live TV when the vaccine came out, and the vaccine came out, and, he, and he's on there getting his vaccine saying, I'm being responsible and all. I told Miss Nett, I said, he's probably only getting a B12 shot. How do we know he's taking a vaccine? Huh? If he started growing fur around his ears and, you know, whiskers and, you know, started hopping around like a bunny, I said, yep, he took it. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. 
normally takes them about four to five years to test over many different avenues and all kinds of things. And, and all of a sudden now it's starting to come out. They've been working on this vaccine for a long time. For years. Huh. Wonder why. Did they know there was going to be an agent released to destroy the world? So somebody could come and take over the world? Just trying to help you. Huh? Just trying to help you. And by the way, they mocked President Trump when he said the vaccine would be out by the end of the year. They mocked him. I haven't heard one of them say, you know what, President was right. They don't like to admit anything he's done is right. Hmm? We see the rapture of the church. That is the next great event in prophecy. Can I say immediately after the rapture of the church, what will transpire? You know, we, we think about what's going to be in heaven. We don't really know. We just get a couple glimpses from the word of God. We don't know what it's all going to be like. It's going to be wonderful. We just don't know about all the wonders. But I do know this, immediately or shortly thereafter, the next thing that will happen is called the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, Paul's talking to the church, and he's talking to Christians. We're talking about the church being raptured or caught out or translated out, however you want to call it. The next thing that will happen concerning the church is the judgment seat of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says this in verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. We're going to the judgment seat of Christ. Now, we will not be judged for sin at the judgment seat of Christ. We were judged for sin at Calvary. When Jesus saved you from your sin, he saved you from your past sin, your present sin, and your future sin. You're saved from sin. But when we get to heaven... We prepare for the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible says we're going to give an account of the deeds done in this body, whether they be good or bad. We're going to give an account of how we conducted this vessel after we got saved. You're going to be judged based on what you did by the Bible. Last week, we talked about our obligations to the church. You're going to be judged on how you treated God's church. You're going to be judged on your attendance. You're going to be judged on uh, if you've tithed to it and gave to it. You're going to be judged if you prayed for it. You're going to be judged if you witnessed to folks and invited them to them, tried to win folks to Jesus. You're going to be judged for all those things that the Bible teaches us that we are obligated to do because we were bought by price. You don't have to pray whether or not it's right to come to church. God already said, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. That means whether we're wearing a pandemic. That means whether you're having a bad day. That means whether you face some hardship. Hmm? You know, if God's only good enough to serve Him when you're on the mountaintop, then you aren't worthy to call upon him when you're in the valley. Hmm? But we're going to give an account of the deeds done in this body. Not only according to what the Bible told us to live, because you're going to be judged by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. You're also going to be judged by what the Holy Spirit dealt with you about. There's times you're sitting in church service and the preacher hadn't even started preaching. The Holy Spirit says, go pray. And you say, well, now, what will people think? 
Holy Spirit says go and pray, you go and pray. You might be holding the key that turns the whole service upside down. And God didn't ask you to go pray if He didn't need for you to do something. When the Holy Spirit tells you to call somebody and talk to them, maybe invite them to church, or maybe tell them you missed them, or, or maybe tell them you know, you've been talking about them like a dog, whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do, and you tell the Lord, okay, I'll get to it, and you never get to it, the Lord's keeping a record. When you sat in the church service during the invitation period and the Holy Spirit's trying to deal with somebody and all you're concerned about is getting your car, your car keys out and getting your coat on and packing up your Bible and your mind's about going to Cracker Barrel, not about what God's doing in the service, Holy Spirit's taking record of that. You're going to give an account for every invitation you sat in, whether or not you did business with God. You're going to give an account of every message you've ever heard preached. I've got over 15,000 outlines. I'm going to give an account over every one of them I've preached, and I don't even remember all the ones that i preached, but God does. You're going to give an account of every message that's been preached since you was a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church, whether you was here or not. See, if you miss, you need to get a copy of it because you're still responsible of it, responsible for it. You're going to give an account. Not only are you going to give an account of the message, you're going to give an account of what you did with the message. Boy, it's getting real quiet. Where's all that shouting that was going on a minute ago? I'm still, I'm still giving you the same truth. I mean, you're already in heaven. But now it's payday. Now it's doing a reckoning with God. And the Bible says there in 1 Corinthians 3, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it will, shall be revealed by fire. Now, I don't know. There's some people believe that there will be a screen, and everybody's going to see every deed you did in your body. See, right now you got them presumptuous sins, you got them hidden sins, them secret sins and all that, but God sees them all. And there's some people believe that everybody's going to see them all one of these days. Hmm? This net, I, I told the choir the other day, and I think I might mention Sunday night, we watched that Dolly Parton movie it's on CMT about the circle of, of, of light and all the blessings when she's a little girl. Well, we liked that one so much, we went back and saw, found the Code of Colors one, and we watched that one. Uh, first of all, we made this observation. The little girl playing do Dolly, that's Addie Page, if I ever seen her. She's a little, little, you know, spry, bossy little thing. I'm thinking, that's Addie Page right there. Uh, but we watched that. And in the first one, I didn't understand the second one, the dad had a real problem with the lady that ran the general store. Well, we found out when we watched the first one. See, Dolly had seven brothers and sisters at the time. Well, Mama was pregnant with number eight, but she lost the baby. Sad, 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 sad. Really upset the whole family. Well, Mama finally gets better, Daddy and Mama go to town, and they go in the store. Daddy's going to buy some seed to plant to have some crops for the next season. Well, long-tongued church lady that runs the store, her and some of the other church ladies, they don't realize that Daddy and Mama's sitting there. They'd come back into the store, and they're talking like them like they're devils. And said that God judged their family and took that baby. And just me, me. Well, the daddy wasn't saved. He kind of told them all, called them a bunch of hypocrites. And he refused to go to church because of people like that. Uh, I wonder if God's going to reveal when everybody talked about folks in the church. You know, the Bible says a whole lot about backbiting. Mm -mm. I wonder when God's going to reveal what people had to say about folks. See, we're going to give an account. And you're not giving account to some kangaroo court. You're before the 
judge of all judges king of kings whose eyes are as flames of fire so I want that God of mercy you got him right now but you're going to stand before him one day the judgment seat of Christ you see we got to go through the judgment seat of Christ because he's come back for a church without spot and without wrinkle and see he has to purge us now the Bible does say those deeds that we've done that were good that comes out gold, silver, and precious stones that bad's wood, hay, and stubble it burns up hmm. it'll be the judgment seat of Christ then the next great prophetical event after the judgment seat of Christ is the marriage supper of the Lamb Revelation 19 says this verse 7 let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints uh, and he saith unto me right blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb and he saith unto me these are the true sayings of God you see, we couldn't go to the marriage supper if we don't go to the judgment seat because we couldn't put on that fine twine linen, that wedding garment, had we not been judged and purged. Then we get to go to the marriage supper and he's going to serve us at the marriage supper. Now I've got good news for you. You've got a place at the marriage supper. Where do you see the china in heaven? Where do you see the utensils in heaven? Where do you see the bounty in heaven? Huh? I mean, he just sent down some manna and it blew Israel away. Can you imagine the whole feast of God and what he's got? Now get a hold of this. Uh, he's been preparing uh, for you and I to get to go to glory for 2,000 years. Uh, hey, I'm here to tell you, mama gets to keep cooking in the kitchen. Uh, 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 and her cookies, nine minutes, they come out and that's just like heaven to me. Uh, uh, she gets to fixing that broccoli and cheese casserole for 45 minutes. Uh, that's like heaven to me. Uh, uh, can you imagine Jesus preparing something for 2,000 years? Uh, how wonderful! Uh, how precious! Uh, how uh, 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 wonderful it all be my dear friends we're going to the marriage supper I say this all the time we're, we're going to the marriage feast not the marriage fast uh, uh, you know you can be Gandhi if you want I'm going home to be with Jesus huh and I'm going to eat it all whoa because you're going to have a glorified body you don't gain any weight you don't get sick you don't get stuffed you don't even have to burp because I'm sure there ain't no burping in heaven. You just keep eating. It'll be wonderful. Hmm? Huh? We saw Elf again the other night. I love that scene when he gives that 15-minute burp and he said, did you hear that? Huh? Little boy says, you are so weird. Huh? Huh? Ain't no burping in heaven. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be wonderful. Next great event is the rapture. And then we're going to have to go to the judgment seat. But then we celebrate at the marriage feast. And it'll be there that we'll see the whole body of Christ. We'll all wear that same garment which reflects His holiness and His beauty and His glory. And it's there we will feast and we will appreciate Him and we will give our uh, epitaphs of love towards him and he will to us uh, and it'll be there that we are ever united with him forever forever we're not getting the earth we're getting New Jerusalem because we're with him we're his bride and we'll be with him forever and ever and it'll be at that feast where he'll instruct us for what will happen when we come back with him. Now, wow, we are enjoying the translation when we're enduring the judgment seat, but then when we are absolutely feasting and having the gala of a time at the marriage 
Supper. There's a period going on here called the Great Tribulation period. And we'll pick up there next week. Let's all stand tonight. You may be here, you may be saved, but you know as sure as you're sitting here, you're not ready to face Him and give an account of the things you've done in your life. You ought to get in this altar and beg God to forgive you. Ask God to help you, to prepare you for when you'll face Him at the judgment seat. My dear friends, it's exciting, but it's sobering. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, we can see just over the horizon you're coming as soon. This old world is so ready for your return, but your church isn't. The Antichrist and his crowd is so excited about them taking over. And yet your people aren't excited about you coming because they've had too many attachments to this world. Help us to be sober. Help us to be alert. Help us to be ready and looking for you at your coming. Now God, I pray there's somebody amongst us who isn't saved. Lord, you'd speak to their hearts. God, we'd see them get born again. God, I pray for those that are here that are saved, but they're just not ready to meet you. I pray they'd get ready. They'd live every moment of every day from this day forward looking for your coming. God, I pray. Oh, I pray that we'd be impacted enough to impact somebody else for your glory. Help us now. Be with these on this altar. You know what they need. God, speak to hearts, and we'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.